The war between Israel and Hamas has caused an eruption of anger and grief in many corners of the world. It has also launched governments into action, and first among them, the U.S. and the Biden White House. But even inside government, there is some disagreement about the approach. Here's Nick Schifrin. The State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs is responsible for most arms transfers to American allies and partners. And for more than 11 years, Josh Paul ran its Congressional and Public Affairs Office. He wrote in his public resignation letter this week, he knew his job was not, quote, without moral compromise, but calls the transfer of weapons to Israel, quote, short-sighted, destructive, and unjust. And Josh Paul joins me now. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. To the news hour. Uh, so why are weapons transfers to Israel in this moment unjust? So let's back up and recognize what we're talking about. We're talking about the transfer of arms that can last for decades whose purpose is to kill. That's an obvious point, um, but it underlines the gravity of the decisions that we make every single day uh, in the U.S. government and the State Department. Um, recognizing that, the Biden administration earlier this year issued a conventional arms transfer policy which raised the standard for the transfer of weapons to what they call a more likely than not. If it is more likely than not that weapons the U.S. provides to another country will be used for violations of human rights, uh, they will not be transferred. Um, what we've seen with Israel repeatedly in operations in Gaza in 2009, in 2014, 2021, is massive civilian casualties, thousands of Palestinians killed, uh, through a, a relatively indiscriminate use of bombs to destroy buildings. Um, and yet, in this context of this conflict today, uh, where we've already seen, again, thousands of Palestinian casualties, uh, there has been no policy debate. Indeed, there's been a rush to provide arms uh, where normally there is discussion, consideration, and thought. So the Israeli Defense Forces, I should say, say that they only target Hamas officials, Hamas weapons, uh, and, and rocket launch sites. Uh, it sounds like what you said at the end there is one of your key criticisms. Did you raise your concerns within state, and what was the response? Uh, I raised them, in fact, uh, as soon as two days after the uh, Hamas atrocity. And let me just be clear, uh, that was an atrocity and an outrage uh, full stop, period, no further uh, caveats. Um, shortly after that, I raised concerns that, look, we've seen that for 20 years, um, the provision of security assistance to Israel, and for longer than that, has not led to peace. And instead, uh, it has used, uh, the way it has employed that security uh, is actually led us further from peace. And so I uh, wrote to uh, a number of leaders within uh, the department uh, two days after Hamas's attack and said, uh, you know, I recognize that there's going to be a, a demand signal for arms to Israel. Can't we for once stop and think about if this is actually getting us to where we need to be before we move forward? And what was the response? Uh, no response. Um, and, and, how un and how unusual is that? It's extremely unusual. Uh, you know, if you think about other countries in the region, I, I, I won't name names, but there are obviously a number where there are troubling human rights records. And the debate over arms sales requests that come from those countries can last within the administration itself for months, sometimes even years. During your time, though, uh, the United States, for example, uh, I will name names, <laughs> provided <laughs> arms to Egypt, mm -hmm. widely criticized yep. for its human rights abuses, and to the Saudi coalition yes. that has killed uh, many, many civilians in Yemen and accused of violating the laws of war yes. by Human Rights Watch. Why do you not resign after those arms transfers? Because those were cases where I could make a difference and manage through my work and the work of many others in the department uh, to add some uh, elements to it. So, for example, uh, there is a training program that has been going on uh, now with Saudi pilots to improve their targeting. Um, and, and in the case of Egypt, of course, we have, you know, Leahy vetting, where units that are identified to be involved in gross violation of human rights are not eligible to receive U.S. weapons. There is a Leahy vetting process for Israel. It has never found an Israeli unit to be guilty of a gross violation of human rights. It's a broken system. Okay, well, you could argue that isn't that proof that the vetting that State Department does do, you say, of the Israel's defense forces have not found a violation of Leahy. Does that mean that they don't violate Well, they've, Leahy? they've identified many, but they have not been able to come to a conclusion which requires senior level sign-off within the department. Just to be clear, are you, are you saying that there have been units inside Israel's defense force that the State Department has been concerned about? Yes. Their violations or their actions, you've brought that to senior officials and over the years consistently they have not acted on it. That, that is correct. Uh, these questions, of course, were put to Matt Miller, the State Department spokesman, uh, earlier today. Let's take a listen to what he said. We comply with all applicable 
Congress, uh, statutory requirements and regulatory requirements in our provision of military assistance to Israel as we do to every other country in the world. Isn't that what the U.S. pushes, and isn't that the policy? I think that is right. We have complied with the laws. The problem is that the laws are intentionally vague in some cases. So, for example, uh, they require a determination that something has happened uh, in terms of gross violation of human rights before um, uh, sanctions, as they were, could be applied. So, yes, absolutely, we are acting within the law. Um, the question is, is that good enough? And we are certainly not acting within the conventional arms transfer policy. Finally, uh, you have deep experience in the region, you have connections uh, throughout the region. Do those connections drive your opinion on this? They certainly drive a lot of my passion. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what has driven me throughout my service in the Political Military Affairs Bureau uh, is a passion for human rights, something that has compelled me always to look at those issues uh, and to carry them forward as something that we need to do better on and can do better on. Josh Paul, thank you very much. Thank you.